We are back. It's time for another golden episode of the Wrestling Perspective 387 with MLW champion Alex Kane. Alex, listen, man, I'm going to tell you, when the opportunity arose to have you on, oh, oh let's know you fucking do it, Lars. You know me, guys, we have on there champions that don't bring their belts on? You know what? You That's come, wild you... to me. So let me just tell you how Alex has already come correct with this whole thing. First off, he shows up with his death metal, you know, Alex Kane in the background. And then as you're introducing him, he throws the 10 pounds of gold. And I will call it 10 pounds of gold I'm, over, his sho- over his shoulder to kind of say, I'm here. So I, 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 I apologize, Dennis. But that was, some, that was smooth. Thank you. I, Thank you. I, I, Lars, maybe one other person, but we had to beg him to go get their belt. That's crazy. Uh, I think it was Josh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm we, we'll have to go back through, but yeah, you yeah. all right now, favorite guest, golden episode. All right. I'm gonna kiss your butt here for a second and tell you that uh growing up, Ron Simmons was always one of my all-time favorite wrestlers. You and I kind of have a Georgia connection. I grew up in Ellenwood, Georgia, okay. uh Clinton County area. I don't know if you're familiar with that. A little bit. Uh, so this is I'm not sure how to ask this question, but I have a daughter who's LBGQ and mm-hmm. uh, she's in high school. I've been out of high school for 20 years, so I don't know. Back in my day, if you were different, like I was a wrestling nerd, we got picked on, bullied, pushed around. Mm-hmm. I I she seems to be adjusting well, but you uh, being LGB black in the South and and in in the wrestling. How did you not let all that cultural, I don't know, bullying or being an outcast push you out into some other trage- trajectory in life? Um, because professional wrestling was literally like the only thing I wanted to do in life. Like, um, like before I discovered it, like I wanted to be a police officer and maybe go to the military. But once I saw it, like professional wrestling was it. Like I would tell literally anybody whether I got bullied for it or not. I told everybody that I knew that would listen to me that I was going to be a professional wrestler. Um, So, and then also like my family was pretty supportive about it. The friends that I have were pretty supportive about it. They all thought it was cool. Like even growing up, like my like wrestling coach was supportive of it, like football coaches and stuff like that. So like I had a, amongst all the bullies and stuff like that, like I had a pretty good support system as far as like following my dreams. When you first saw professional wrestling and you kind of knew like, hey, this is something I wanted to do. What were you watching? Who was who were the guys that or gals that were inspiring you to kind of get in the ring and place up the boots? Um, I saw Stone Cold's Demolition. um, uh, I think I was like six or seven. um, And it was can't it's it's fuzzy because it's been a long time. But I believe it was um, going up, building up to his match with undertaker at bad blood it was a hell in the cell mm. match um i think it was i think it was kane's debut um oh okay and so like that was the first time i saw it and like stone cold steve austin if you're going to get an introduction to professional wrestling yeah i feel like that would probably be the best introduction because he's a rebel he beat the crap out of his boss he's swearing he's drinking beer like he's doing everything that you would want to do if you were an adult but you can't i mean i wasn't an adult but still he made he made being an adult look cool it's not by the way you're still young being an adult is not cool so don't don't rush into it i'm gonna tell you now from one adult to another almost um i i will say this you i'm i'm looking over the timeline of your career in the grand scheme of being a champion, you're still very new into the industry. Yeah. Are you still young enough where you don't quite succumb to the pressures of being like a champion or feel that pressure of being maybe a 22, 23 year vet in the industry would feel of this might be my last chance. I got to make carrying this belt, you know, uh, my next paycheck down the line kind of feeling. No, I don't really feel that kind of pressure. I kind of just try to take things one day at a time. Like when I was national openweight champion, 
Um, I didn't, I didn't have a super long reign, but I mean, it was still fun to have. Um, and like when court told me like, okay, Hey, you're going to drop the belt this to Davy Richards. I was like, cool. All right, cool. What do you need me to do? Um, and I know a lot of guys get like, they, I guess they get so attached to it um, that when it's time to, you know, pass that torch, you know, they completely lose their minds and like, I don't want to be that. My wife won't let me be that. So um, I just, I just try to keep a level head, take it, uh, take it one day at a time and just, you know, enjoy it and have fun with it. I mean, whether, regardless of however long I hold it. Um, and when I finally do give it up, no one can take away from me that I was a black world champion. Do you think that Hammerstone, I mean, obviously you beat him. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the bodybuilding and the the unfocused maybe that he's he's had in the last, I don't know, say six months, mm -hmm. do you think that was that played part in in you taking advantage of the situation and winning that belt? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. Um I I could tell like in some of the promos like leading up for on uh MLW Fusion, like I could tell like he is worried. Um, he doesn't know if he's actually going to be able to, you know, pull uh, pull it off. Um, he definitely didn't look as comfortable and as confident as nor as he normally is. And then I think he had like lost a bunch of weight or something like that um, because, like, you know, being heavier definitely affects your cardio in the ring. So I think that also played a part. When did it start? When did you start seeing the light of? Holy cow, there's there's this opportunity that I might actually have a shot at being a champion. And can you take us a little bit through those steps of and and maybe kind of in your life where you kind of set yourself up to thinking, all right, I need to complete task A, B, and C in order to put me into the this, this division? Um, I think I got I I'm gonna answer this question the way I think you're asking it. Um, I think the I'm okay with the, that. The, <laughs> moment, the moment that I kind of realized that you know I could I was gonna be a problem in a good way um, was I wrestled um, this guy named O'Shea Edwards who's a member of the Blue May Fight Club now. Um, but this match was like a year or two a year before I signed uh, with MLW, and like that was kind of like a coming out party for me. Like in that match, I realized, okay, like I'm going to be a problem. Even he told me, you, you're going to be a problem. Um, so I think at that point, and then just getting like, like good matches, like leading up to that and like kind of like finding myself, especially in MLW, because the first, the beginning of it was kind of rough. It was definitely kind of rough. Uh, but as I got more comfortable with myself and like really like found a character, um, I definitely knew like, like, Oh, I can definitely be a world champion one day. Um, and then especially with like how like the Bumai Fight Club has gotten over and it's happened organically. Um, and then also like kind of being like a tweener a little bit, which is fun. Like I definitely like have some magic on my hands. Um, well, there's a lot of supremely really good talent in MLW right now. And I think that with all that, that all the wrestling that's out there, and all the opportunity that's out there for wrestlers. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering why you felt more at home there than anywhere else. Because well, I know you so, had opportunities. Um, so in so before I saw MLW, like honestly, no one was like really like in my emails or whatever. Nobody was like barking up my tree or whatever. So like when MLW came to me, um, I had I mean, like things were going well in the independence, but like nothing like really, really big was happening for me. Um, so when they reached out, like my in my mindset, it was I have nothing to lose here. If it works out, because I didn't know if it, whether it was going to work out or not. Like, yes, my style fits into how MLW's presentation is and, you know, my personality and all that. But like, I didn't know that it was going to work out. I just, you know, took that leap um, because it was either it wasn't going to hurt me. It wasn't going to break my career or anything like that. Um, thankfully, it worked out. Thankfully, it worked out. But, um, I, yeah, like, I just, I was just like, let's, let's do this. Like, everybody wants to be signed somewhere. Everybody wants to be invested in uh, whatever. These guys came to me. Um, so, like, let me just, 
let me just take this dive right quick. Where are you in the evolution of your character? Uh, you know, from start to finish, are you kind of in the middle? Are you at the end of being the, you know, final example of who you want to be? No, I'm definitely in the middle. Um, there's still there's still things I'm I'm trying to figure out. Um, there's still like layers I'm trying to add to my character. Um, because like I want to be as well rounded as possible. Um, and I don't think that you I don't think that you ever really get to a final form of a character. Um, it's always constantly evolving. Just just depends on the context in which you're put in. Where are you drawing inspiration to find for your character? Um, so initially, I was drawing inspiration from Chad Johnson, Terrell Owens, Brian Dawkins, um, Clubber Lang uh, from uh, Rocky III, um, a little bit of Apollo Creed. Um, who else? I tried, I, I mean, as far as like moves and stuff like that, like Shelton Benjamin, Kurt Angle, Brock Lesnar. Um, Randy Orton a little bit, Triple H is in there, Steve Austin's in there, The Rock is in there. Um, so I try to like draw a little bit from everything. Um, and then like in some of the movies that I watch, like I I like John Wick's character. So like I'm sure like as I as I complete watch watching that series, like I'm sure there's something in there that I that I'll find and that I can apply to myself. So I'm looking at dipping in all different kinds of media. Well, I actually have a friend who's very successful that's never seen any of the Rocky movies. I digress. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I do want to say you're still fresh as a champion. Mm -hmm. Maybe, what, a month now or so, give or take. I believe somewhere in July you won it. Um, are there any doors or opportunities that are starting to open for you that were not there before that you go, Fuck yeah, now you respect me. Um, definitely like international bookings are starting to open up. It's not a whole lot, but like it's more than it was before. Um, and then just some like companies in the States are actually more willing to talk to me now than they were before. Um, um, it's just it's a lot of the times it's like, oh, they they I guess some I guess some of these companies like expect you to be like really cheap or something like that. So like money's always an issue. <laughs> When it comes to stuff like that but like doors are definitely opening for me i mean i'm here i'm here with y'all well you were going to be here anyways honestly <laughs> I mean, it was just a matter of time everybody does this podcast it's like once you get into a ring you're automatically obligated to come in on the that's show that's not that's that that is definitely not true <laughs> um because I, we try to always have people on this show that represent the current face of professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly, you know, I feel like we bring the top talent here, you know, because I feel like the human interest story and the path to that goal, you know I mean? Whether or not they were on that, on that path from the get go by purpose or something, you know, that they felt that they necessarily had to do. Otherwise they fell into it. And that's one of the things I want to steal a question from one of our old uh, co-hosts. Um, and he used to ask, uh, did you know that you were getting the belt? How did they tell you? How did they, you know, how did he come in and basically said, okay, you're you're going over tonight. You're going to get the belt. When did they let you um, know that this was going to happen? Court told me like two months, uh, no, a few months prior, a few months before Battle Riot is when he told me. Um, and he had, he had also said that this has been his plan the entire time. It's just trying to see like whether you're going to live up to you know live up um live up to the expectation or if you're going to crumble under it and since i continuously kept delivering on everything like he get, he gained like more and more like confidence and faith in me um so yeah he told me like a few months before battle ride because that's why i went in at number one well, let me ask you this. So you're you're you have this information for a couple of months here. I mean, are you adding extra pressure to you? Do you I mean, because it's the, the goal is there. It's like laid out for you, right? Mm -hmm. But it's now it's on you if you're gonna attain that. So what's going through your mind for a couple of months? Are you refocused? Is this always right there in the front? Or is it something that you tuck in the back and kind of go, I'm just gonna continue what I'm doing? 
I'm just, I just kind of tried to continue what I was doing. I tried to step it up in the gym. Well, not just tried to, I did step it up in the gym, um, cardio wise, um, adding uh, like offense to my arsenal that isn't the same stuff that I was doing before. Um, I just tried to like not rebuild myself, but like um, not even reinvent myself, just like upgrade myself um, going into, uh, you know, both the battle ride and the world title match. Um, Cause I wanted to present, I wanted to present something different um, than what was being presented before I got both of those opportunities. How do you plan? Because we all know as quick as you get a belt, you can easily lose it. How do you plan personally to elevate that belt, elevate yourself? Because look, uh, I'm, I don't want to, you know, spoiler anybody, you're probably not going to end your career in MLW. It's just how it happens, right? We all move on. Mm -hmm. We, we evolve, we grow and we cycle out. And then the back of your mind, you have to go, all right, I'm a champion. I add this to my resume. Here's what my highlight reel as a champion is going to look like. What is your game plan going forward? Um, Definitely to, you know, keep having more compelling matches, uh, having more compelling segments. Um, that's probably those two of the probably the things that I focus on the most. Um, I I guess hate to name drop or mention another company or whatever, but they have a certain individual with long hair from Samoa. Um, uh, he's definitely an inspiration for me because of how he's changed the game uh, for you know the people under him. Um, so like I look to like some of the stuff that he's even done. Like being the head, being the uh, the leader of the Bumai Fight Club. Like, like, I feel like there's I can't tell that those exact same stories or whatever because they're family, but like I can you know take take and um, like take pieces and stuff and inspiration from just that there um, to you know apply to myself and to you know raise the bar. Um, I know again whatever the needle mover like that's really that's really the thing that like um that's in my mind like moving the needle and like making an impact like the, the rain doesn't necessarily need to be 800 days it would be dope but it doesn't need to be 800 days but like i just want to make an impact um on you know mlw i mean i've already made an impact on mlw but i want to make an impact on the industry so this is just this is not the uh, the ceiling this is this is something that you're you wanting to break through, basically. Yes. Yeah. All right. With that being said, then you know you're, you're obviously very young. Um, you know, you remind me a lot your attitude and the way that you're talking. You know, of guys who are now in their 30s and in late 30s um, or, or world champions and things like that because they made a decision to give it give the business wholeheartedly everything. You know, they're not there just to, to, to have a Twitch channel and do all this other stuff and to sort of, you know, the main focus is always that in-ring persona, the in-ring wrestling and telling the story in the ring. How yeah. important would now would you say that you're more in the line of a guy that's 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 100 percent pro wrestler or are you just kind of a guy that's in the business just to kind of get likes and 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 to to boost other things over here on the side? I'm definitely 100% a professional wrestler. Like, I, I like, I like, I don't, like, I don't have a Twitch channel or anything like that. Like, the most thing I have is maybe a TikTok or whatever, where you know, I'm being. Well, you're young. Like, you can, you know. Yeah, yeah. A 51 year old should not have a fucking TikTok. <laughs> um, but like, even on there, like, it's still majority wrestling content from me. Um, you know, I try to participate in uh, what they call the Wrestle Talk community. There's like millions of wrestling fans on there. You know, I interact with them because a lot of professional wrestlers don't do that stuff or whatever for whatever reason. Um, so, like, I'm trying to grow as as a professional wrestler, but in also all of these other spheres because those also open doors in wrestling for me. New bookings, like. Somebody could be like, yo, I know this guy, Alex Kane, or whatever. At, I might tell the booker at his local promotion, like, yo, I really want I really want to see this guy live. So, like, like I'm 100% a professional wrestler, but I'm also hustling. 
You know, it just struck me when you were talking about that, that a lot of the champions that come on, Lars and I both know personally. We we know and we see how they interact with fans, and we kind of can talk to them on the side. You're one of these guys that this is our first time talking, our first interaction with you, so we don't really know too much about you. But what is your philosophy when it comes to sitting down with younger wrestlers, even though you are kind of a younger wrestler? And and with the fans, how, you know, maybe who taught you how to interact or be gracious to the fans? Because I feel like that's that's taught in a lot of the wrestlers, champions. They forget about the fans as they move up and, you know, up into different tax brackets. What's what's your your way with that? Um. I was always a, like the wrestling fan that always wanted to like know like I mean I always wanted to know like what 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 was Triple H doing backstage what if he wasn't in the ring or whatever and stuff like that like I always wanted to know like those like pers not like personal life details like some people are now but just like like what are you doing and you're not wrestling um, and to kind of be in the to be in the position that I am as early as I am in that position. If a wrestling fan who's respectful comes to me or whatever, and they want to talk or they have questions, or I'm not gonna like turn them away, because like to me, the the wrestling fans aren't just a transaction at the merch table or online. Like they're people, and I want to treat them like people. Um, and I feel like a lot of wrestlers, when they get to a certain level, they forget that they're people. I mean, sometimes wrestling fans forget that wrestlers are people. But I think if you treat the wrestling fans with respect first, um, you'll have a much easier time than just, you know, oh, don't talk to me here or whatever, or don't message me, like, meet me at the merch table or something like that. And then when it comes to, like, younger wrestlers, I love to teach. Um, I love watching people's matches and, you know, giving them critiques here and there. Um, and I was always taught that, like, there are no facts in professional wrestling essentially because like most of wrestling psychology we kind of made up ourselves and it evolves and it changes um over time so like anytime i'm giving a young wrestler uh you know a critique or something i'm not telling them oh you have to do it like this i'm more of the thought of like okay would you do this in a fight that had you know ropes around you no because it doesn't make sense but you know if my, I guess, psychology is like, can you, what can you do to get the most out of, you know, less? Um, and I feel like that's the mindset of a lot of like older wrestlers, like yeah. less is more, less is really, less is Cause really it more. is, it is. Um, like I've, I've kind of like, I've kind of pieced like some of the new school stuff and some of like mainly really the attitude era stuff. Um, kind of together as far as that goes because like Attitude Era like the wrestling wasn't amazing uh, by any any stretch of the imagination but their stories were told and characters were elevated to probably the highest level um, and like all the top stars had like four or five moves in their arsenal and then everything else was really just storytelling um, and I feel like they made wrestling easy and now like young guys and young people are trying to make it more complicated than it needs to be. Um, so I just try to like pass that to younger wrestlers and stuff. One, so they can save their body some, and then also like they can actually get over. Yeah, I, 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 I'm with you on that. So, you know, you were talking about kind of like the older wrestler, somebody who's been in the business maybe 20, 25 years and how it has a different learning curve and that you probably relate to them more than you relate to maybe the younger wrestler that's kind of what i got mm -hmm. is that that you're coming more from a place of of you know tell the story take your time you know don't you don't have to do fucking 18 cartwheels into a fucking topa or whatever yeah. so, you know you know you don't have to do all that all that stuff has its place and can be cool but yeah. it doesn't have to be every match on the fucking card right so yes. yeah when you're approaching a match and you know and you're talking with your opponent or whatever it is and you guys are working it out it has there ever been a point where you felt like okay this motherfucker's taking it way too far and this is going to be a shit show oh or almost all the time <laughs> almost all the time 
Um, and so what do you do? Well, okay. Well then, then this would be the second part of my question. What do you do to try to curtail that? Um, so, um, Air Fox who wrestles in AEW, he also yeah. trained me. Um, and he would always say like, never try, never butt heads with somebody, just suggest a different way to still get to what they want to do. Um, because like, Sometimes, like sometimes super convoluted spots are cool or whatever. They can be cool depending on how they're done. But a lot of the times it just overcomplicates the match. Cause like sometimes something sounds like a lot, but after you like go over it a few times, like, okay, that's easy or whatever. It kind of calms your nerves. And then other times it sounds like a lot because it is a lot. Um, so <laughs> like, I'm not like, I'll try to make suggestions here and there um, of like how, like how we can like like make it more simple like, but it still be cool but if like they're not budging on it i'm just like whatever i'm still going to i'm still going to be professional i'm still going to be there for you um but uh this is stupid i think what you do next time is just put that belt over your shoulder and be like let me ask the belt hang on <laughs> oh yeah the belt doesn't want to do that i'm actually going to do that that's hilarious <laughs> There you go. That's great. Uh, you know, MLW, you look at it in the grand scheme of the wrestling industry. It is, you know, I feel like MLW was kind of where Impact was 10 years ago, where everybody's like, Impact's going to die. Impact's dead. But yet they never go away. They always keep their head above the water, put out a great product. And, and every year when someone says this is the last year we're going to see MLW or Impact, they just keep chugging along. How do you now, as the face of the company, say, it's my job to elevate the company? This is how I'm going to do it. Um, Definitely, like, the locker room culture has always been cool at MLW, but, like, some, like, in the last, like, six or seven months, it has it's been kind of, like, off. Um, and like as the face of the company, locker room leader type stuff, like I think gr I think a great show starts in the locker room. Um, so like trying trying to foster that environment where like, you know, we can all talk to each other, we can all be cool or whatever, we all cheer each other on, give each other advice and stuff like that. I feel like that is going just having that kind of locker room culture is gonna take us to the next level. Cause if we're all if every single match from the bottom to the top of the card is on the same page of like, okay, we're here tonight. We're here to put on the best show possible, tell the best stories, you know, get over all that other stuff. If we are, if we're all on one accord and, you know, all have the same mindset, like, I feel like the sky's the limit, but if like everybody's like, have everybody with, has their egos or whatever, or doesn't understand, like, like this is a business, like, you know, your time, your, sometimes your time's up, sometimes your time's not. Um, but, like, if people don't understand, you know, that aspect of it or whatever, then, yeah, it, we could definitely tank and destroy everything. So as the face of the company, like, my biggest job is fostering a positive locker room culture. All right, for my last question, then, you know, one of the things I always see with champions, especially world champions is they have a maturity level kind of already set and if they don't then they have to almost mature up to the point where over mature in a quick amount of time do you yeah. feel like since you've had the bell albeit it hasn't been very long in the in the in the scheme of things do you feel like that the, that holding that belt being put in this position has made you more of a mature human being a mature, a mature wrestler, a mature, a more mature uh, communicator, et cetera. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I, and I feel like, like everything, every opportunity that they put in front of me kind of prepared me to be in this position. Um, and it's all, it's spilled over into my personal life. It's spilled over into like regular work life stuff. Um, it's, I've, I've noticed, I've noticed how much I've grown um, you know, since, you know, day one in the company and also day one in wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, definitely being a world champion has a uh, being a world champion and knowing that I was going to become world champion has definitely changed how I see things, changed my mindset. 
I am going to forgo my question, but add a suggestion. And I'm going to say, I hate when someone comes up to me and goes, I got a suggestion for you. And with that being said, I've got a suggestion for you. So great. Uh, I'm going to do the thing I hate. And I kind of goes back to talking to the belt. But if you start, you need to start. And I've never seen a, uh, a champion ever do this, Lars. Correct me if I'm wrong, but next time you're in the middle of a program and someone comes up to you and they're, you know, hey, what the mic and they're like, Johnny Fartface just uh, challenged you to a match. Put the belt over your shoulder and belt says he doesn't want to wrestle him tonight. Walk away. Like the belt says from <laughs> here on out, if you're not doing some sort of championship promo where eh, the belt says we're going for it tonight. That right there, I feel that like that is a great suggestion. I'm gonna a great use suggestion. That. I'm gonna use that. I think it, I think that's an amazing suggestion. And no, I don't think anybody's ever done that. I don't know. I, you know, I'm just throwing it out there right now. Uh Alex, where can people find you? Because I'm gonna tell you, uh absolutely a pleasure talking to you right now. Um, you can find me on Twitter and TikTok, both at Alex underscore Kane eleven. You can find me on Instagram at the Suplex Assassin. I advise you that if you're not a promoter, not to find me on Facebook, but it is what it is. Um, YouTube uh, is just out. You're just typing Alex Kane. You'll find it. Um, um, where else? I think that's about it. Those are all the places where I uh, do social things. Lars, golden episodes. I love it when things get a little golden around here. And Alex, thank you for bringing the belt, setting a standard up here where fucking champions that come on the show better start bringing their belts. Because if you don't whip out the belt in the middle of a podcast, you don't represent a true champion. That's the way I feel, Lars. You don't Lars. represent a true champion. You don't represent a true company. Like you, you do, you're doing it wrong. You, you should be proud. You should be proud of being a, being a champion. Alex Kane, the standard setter. That's it. The standard setter. I'm the standard the belt, setter. Alex Kane, the belt made me do it. The belt, the belt made, made me do, do it. it. Oh, my God. Listen, uh, everybody, this is this week's Wrestling Perspective. Thank you so much, Lars. Me, Dennis Farrell. New email address, wrestling perspective podcast at gmail.com. Get your questions in there. We'll start doing the questions again here soon. Alex Kane, MLW champion, thank you so much for cutting a few minutes out of your night to talk wrestling with us. Thank you for having me. It's definitely a pleasure.